Welcome to another edition of Why Blank Lost. I'm David Bloomberg, and with me as always is my only final two ally. I, I promise you can trust <laughs> mm -hmm. me, Jessica Lewis. Really? I believe you mentioned before that I was your ride or die, but you were also going to ship me out the door. Just a couple weeks back, I think it was. I, 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 you must be hearing that from mm. someone else. Really? Um, no, well, no. Anyway, that. our guest this week is uh, somebody who has historically tried to kill me every single time we've been on <laughs> video together, which is okay because I've tried to kill her each time as well. Welcome longtime RHAP patron and my friend, Anessa Hewitt. Hi, thank you. And what the heck? I thought I was your ride or die. What am I, your Enzo? No, yeah, I, I don't know what you're talking about. See? You know? There's apparently multiple Final Two deals going on here. No, sure. mm -hmm. no, never, never. Mm -hmm. I would never try to clip either of you. <laughs> we'll see who gets the best of it. Yes, yes. Um, now, Inessa, for those people whom you haven't killed while playing Mafia, um, <laughs> would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, thank you so much. Um, so my name is Anessa Hewitt. Uh, in real life, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I represent workers, you know, all over the country, make sure they're getting paid correctly and otherwise treated fairly at work. Like you said, I'm a longtime patron. I've been involved in the RHAP community for many years. Many of the live know-it-all goers may know me as the queen of the after party. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm just really excited to be here on this podcast. I have a lot of opinions about Mr. Memphis. And I'm happy yeah. to get to it. <laughs> like right. this. She's yes. coming in hot. This is well, good. Yeah. Ooh, like it. All right. For anyone who's new to the podcast, each week we look at the player who got evicted and analyze their gameplay using what we saw on TV, live feeds, interviews, and other information like my own interviews and columns from their original season, as we have in this case. Uh, we compare everything about their game to a set of guiding rules I originally wrote in 2004 and have modified since, including the most recent version that anyone can find at robhaswebsite.com slash bigbrotherrules. Now, before we get to the rules in Memphis, there are a few things to discuss about the week in general. And I, I have to start with a comment from Cody that I, I cannot allow to go by without saying something. Please be it, what I think you're going to say. <laughs> it, was, it was the beginning of what was supposed to be a heartfelt moment about his girlfriend. And he said, it's day 69 in the house and I'm missing my girlfriend so much. Uh, <laughs> there's a better one. And, not better where I thought one. he was going with this. Yeah. And, <laughs> I'm like, did they seriously let that pass accidentally? Or was there some editor in the back going, I got that through. Nice. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that's what it was. There was probably some editor going, snuck that one in there. That wasn't the only number thing that he mentioned that I thought was funny. It was, it's really difficult to count to six. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, when I had to get to, I messed up when I was trying to count to five, but he, he actually said, you know, it's really difficult to count to six. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and I'm sure he meant in the moment, you know, that there's a lot of things happening, but the way that it came out was it was really difficult to count to six. So there you go. <laughs> Numbers. He's apparently keeping very good track of the daisies in the house, but counting might be a difficult thing. I don't know. Uh, that's important day. You know, especially <laughs> for him and his girlfriend. Um, so I, I do also want to mention an interview quote from Memphis. He said, I think they've kind of been like sheep this whole season. Whoever the HOH wanted, went out or wanted out, went out. I was sitting through the season thinking, why do you vote for who they wanted? You might think now, now that was all a quote from him. Now, you might think that this was an interview from like the past few days. But it was actually what Memphis told me after season 10. Oh, <laughs> well, okay. that's interesting. Yes. Now, once again, we see that even when people complain about like a new school game being played a certain way, you look back and you find that the same sort of thing was going on in this case 12 years ago. Mm, interesting. And he was one of the ones basically leading the charge to mm -hmm. do that this season. So, hmm. well, he. Apparently learned it from uh, learned it from his own first season where he made Apparently. final two. Well, it worked then, right? Yeah. Except he it didn't almost... win. Well, right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so those were my two things. I don't know if either of you have anything else you want to discuss. Well, I thought I. I thought this week was really fun. It was really hilarious trying to see uh, Memphis play this because he was so certain of himself. He mm. was so sure that he was safe. You know, it doesn't even matter who wins the veto, he was saying. It was really funny. 
And the strategically interesting part was to see like a proxy battle between uh, Nicole and Enzo for Mem for what's his name Cody's you know allegiance mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was quite telling to see that he sides with Nicole here um you know so round one for second place goes to Nicole but you know otherwise I I I, th I thought this week was pretty interesting yeah yeah it was a it, it was seemed to be a week filled with a lot more actual strategic discussion which I think has been lacking throughout the entire <laughs> season because there really hasn't been much of a need for it because the commission or the committee or whatever group, you know, has been like <laughs> just running the house. And so to see the strategic discussions shift the way that they did was, it was a nice change of pace for sure. Yeah. 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 All right. Well then uh, we can go ahead and move on to the rules. Julie Chen claimed to Dalton Ross that Memphis played with no emotion, no waffling and in full control of his game. Memphis did what Memphis wanted to do and never took anyone else's game into consideration unless it could help him. He seemed to understand this is ultimately a game of one against all. Now, all of that sounds great, but is any of what Julie said true? Heck, even if there is a part of it that's correct, was it actually good for his game? We'll figure that out as we take a closer look than Julie ever does. Uh, indeed, <laughs> looking back at Memphis' original season, there were some similarities to this one, but also some glaring differences. Let's discuss all of those as we figure out why Memphis lost. The first and most important rule is, of course, to scheme and plot. This is something Memphis knew from his first time in the game, and he carried with him to this time. He formed the commission with Cody and then wanted to add others as a layer of protection. Thus, the committee was born, at least to him. The others were pretty much together anyway. Uh, but, but that doesn't really matter here so much as his intent and the way he handled it. Uh, as Dalton Ross noted in one of his interview questions, Pre-jurors were surprised to find out that Memphis was involved in the big alliance, and Memphis chalked that up to him staying away from the others when all of everybody else would, would gather together. He knew how to keep up appearances, and indeed, Nicole A. told Mike Bloom way back when that she thought Memphis was a lone wolf who was mainly working with Janelle and Kaser, which actually fit into her early plan, or his early plan, of wanting to make both sides of the house think he was with them and he succeeded for a while yes i do think that if anything memphis did incredibly well was having the ability to be so <clears throat> unknown it was a shock to everyone who left the house to find out who was part of that six inclusive of memphis and christmas those were the two that people never expected to see included so he really did a phenomenal job of getting information from both sides because both sides didn't really know, like they, I guess, assumed that he was just with them, but he was only really with one side, but still able to get information from both sides because he was so good at being <clears throat> stealthy in that regard. Yeah. I mean, spoiler alert. I think that this rule of him scheming and plotting is his biggest downfall. So I have uh -huh. a lot to say about this rule. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I can t I can say now, like, I, I think it. that Memphis came into this game, you know, playing the old school version of this game. You know, you make an alliance and you drive it to the end. And mm. he correctly assumed that it was in everybody's best interest to stay true to the committee. And it was. It was in everybody's best interest. That's why it got him so far, because that's true. But while he made this big alliance, he then sat back and thought, I'm done here. Everything is good. And then he went to bed at nine o'clock while everybody within that alliance was busy fortifying those individual relationships and building really strong bonds. He was asleep while everybody was building their final twos and their final threes. And then way later into the game, when there was nobody else left, he finally woke up and said, hey, you know what? It's time to, to make another final two. So let me bring Enzo as my core into these intersecting two alliances. But it was way too late. He had already had a final two with Cody from way earlier on to the game and you know he was wrong to assume that that would be good enough so you know somebody else is already taking Enzo to the dance and at this point <laughs> it was way too late he he did not scheme and plot enough by the time he got around to scheming and plotting it was too late and the only final two he did have was then with Cody was bumped to a final four by only including him in one of his alliances and he just didn't have the social capital or the you know game long relationships and the trust to pull off like these competing two alliances because he didn't scheme and plot 
early on enough when other people definitely did. Wow. Yeah. There was so much, but these, are, and <laughs> listen, I want to, I, I want to go back into some of that because I do think that it is that spot on. Absolutely. He did sit back and I think he, he relaxed too much, but I also feel like he thought that he was scheming and plotting more than anybody because he was, oh. I mean, if you, and if you look at it, he was really the only one who was, I think being a little more creative in his mechanism of how to create these alliances. He created the two groups of three, the wise guys, which I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a neat little trick. If you think about it, like I'm going to, I'm well, I know we're going to get there. I know we're going to get there, but I mean, we're talking about scheming and plotting, right? We don't right. necessarily have to say whether or not it was good scheming and plotting, <laughs> but he was at least trying a method in saying, okay, if I'm going to solidify myself with these two groups of three to try to get myself further. But I think you're completely accurate in saying that he then kind of slept on it, you know, where it was like, okay, I'm locked in with these people. And because I'm locked in, we're good. We're golden <laughs> without taking an extra step saying, listen, if I'm doing this, someone else is probably doing this too, or someone else might be doing this better, or someone might be telling on me like Enzo sharing information with Cody about this wise guys alliance. So I think he really did put too much stock and faith in the people that he had formed that initial bond with and created that six. And then each of those groups of three. So he was certainly trying to scheme and plot, but his manner in which he went about doing it really ended up becoming his detriment because he didn't take it the next step further that he needed in order to gain the complete and total trust. Like you see with Cody and Enzo, like you see with Nicole and Cody, there's something deeper there. And it's not just about this group that they created this alliance there's an actual like friendship there's a trust there's a level that nobody nobody had that with memphis because he didn't take the time to do that yeah yeah i mean he he even told david early in the game that modern big brother players look at the game as uh, like a team but only two make the final two and only one win so everyone should do what's best for themselves but he believed the committee was best for him and yeah got him to final five but the group at some point had to turn in on itself mm -hmm. and he in his mind had deals with everyone but tyler and nicole but those deals didn't hold up for in part reasons that <clears throat> nessa just mentioned and in part reasons that we'll get to in a moment here <laughs> <laughs> so um so we might as well move on to that which is the second rule and tells players not to scheme and plot too much uh unless you had more for the first um and of course it tells them to keep their uh scheming secret and, and and this is one of the places where we find a reason that some of those deals didn't hold up at the end he and again in addition to what anessa said he was so confident that cody mm -hmm. and enzo would keep him because of that wise guys alliance but he seems to have forgotten that he made two versions of that, <laughs> one with Cody and one with Christmas. And when Enzo spilled the beans to Cody, as he's done all season, Cody flat out said he couldn't trust Memphis because he created a second wise guys, but he would act like he trusted him until the time was right. Uh, Memphis at one point said, I built the wise guys to save my ass. But the thing is building two groups of wise guys is one big thing that got his ass kicked. Yes, 100%. Yeah, yeah. And I do think is as, as far as this, this concept of the two different versions of a final group of three, I think is a good idea. If you have two different people on each side of those right. three, like, I mean, yes. having that one overlap is where his really big issue stems from because Enzo, as we've seen, his loyalties are with Cody. And also he is um, sharing a lot of information that people have shared with him. And so Obviously, Memphis was trusting him, but I think Memphis didn't spend enough time trying to really determine, can I trust this person? He just kind of assumed if I present this idea to him, which I think Memphis did this with basically everybody in the house. If he had an idea, it was always like, all right, I got a deal for you. And you're not going to be able to pass up on this because this is such a good deal. <laughs> like he really had this like really bad car salesman way about trying to sell things to people. And when they would walk away from it, they would go, this isn't a good deal for me. What is he talking about? It was a good deal for Memphis, but not a good deal for them because he never put a spin on it that made it work for them in addition to him. He always presented it like it was 
it was a great idea, but really they, they've played this game enough that they can read between the lines and see that, no, this is a deal that Memphis wants because it's good for Memphis. And so I, I again, want to give him credit for trying this idea of I'm going to have two different wise, cry, wise guys alliances, but he really did screw up by having one person be in both of those groups of three. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. And I think that, you know, calling two alliances by the same name for what he calls was shits and giggles, you know, is bold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, I think he was pretty naive to think that he wouldn't get caught here uh, because, you know, in this game where the only currency you really have is information, uh, sometimes it is the correct move to use that information to get closer to other people in the game. Right. And he presumed, like Jessica said, he presumed that it would be in Enzo's best interest to be in this, you know, quote, final two with him because he was at the core of both alliances. But see, Enzo could actually like have his cake and eat it too, because there's nothing that prevents him from also still being in this alliance, uh, these both, you know, duplicative alliances, intersecting alliances, and then also sh using that information to get closer to Cody. So he like didn't understand that, you know, Enzo was incentivized to say yes to the deal and then use the deal against him later on, which is, you know, exactly what he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I am curious. I am curious to ask you guys if you think that it would have worked better instead of using Enzo as the center here to use Tyler because Tyler, you know, never told Enzo about the committee. And he also never, he wasn't like so blindly loyal to Cody and he already had a final two with Christmas. And I know that, you know, Memphis didn't really know all this, but it could have actually worked with Tyler and Enzo's spot there. Um, yeah, it might have. It might have. The problem was Memphis had like nothing with Tyler at all. And, yeah. uh, you know, whereas he had connected with Enzo early on, somewhat at least. Um, so, but if you had transplanted those people, then yeah, I think, I, I think it could have worked then, but I, I think this goes back to Memphis just not being a very good judge of the people he was playing with mm -hmm. because this wasn't the only time he was busted double dealing because he trusted the wrong people. You know, he had no idea that Enzo was passing everything to Cody. He was also clueless even now as to how close Nicole and Cody are. Right. Right. Uh, right. Right. You know, because he tried to convince her to backdoor Cody. But then when they were playing pool, we saw it on the show. He was acting to Cody like, oh, I would have been so upset if, if she had backdoored <laughs> you. And it got Cody so mad that he was just standing in the backyard muttering to himself about yeah. it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I do think that it's it's interesting to see Memphis have a very bad ability at trying to share information. He's somewhat like I don't even really know the best way to describe it, but I watching these individuals play the game, some of them are very good at the manner in which they present whatever it is that they know. And it comes across as concerning for the person they're talking to. And, and there's some believability there in the way it's presented. I think Nicole is doing a, a really good job at she listens a lot and then she shares bits of information. Uh, I think Cody is doing a great job of taking in so much information and only sharing what he needs to share. But it's like Memphis feels like if I if I put on a show and if I present this, well, then they have to believe me because I because I had this conversation with Cody and it it seemed so forced and it seemed so disingenuous that, of course, Cody's not going to walk away from that thinking, oh, yeah, Memphis is he's being <sighs> completely truthful with me right now. He's being completely honest because it's not the way it was presented. And I think that that's unfortunately for Memphis, something that people became to know about him. They always knew that he was wheeling and dealing, that he was he was overcomplicating things, that he was he was presenting things like, oh, it's it's Memphis's way or the highway. And we heard a lot of them say. Memphis is going to do what Memphis wants. It doesn't matter. He comes in and tells us things, but he's going to do what he wants. And that was what his narrative became. So instead of him being someone felt people felt they could go to and trust in him and trust what he's telling them, they were always questioning his motives and always questioning why he was doing it. And it was never for anyone else's best interest except Memphis. But I do think with the wise guy thing, if he really wanted to, overlap and have one other person be in both he should have gone to christmas i think as opposed to Ooh. 
as opposed to Enzo, because he had such a close relationship with Christmas. Christmas wanted to go to the end with him. He wanted to go to the end with Christmas. And I feel like Christmas was someone who presented herself to Memphis and also to the commission as extremely loyal. And I mean, she named her son loyal because that's what she believes in is loyalty. <laughs> so, you know, I do think that that might have been a better play for him because she might not have shared the information the way Enzo did. I don't know. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, you mentioned Christmas, and another aspect of the rule discusses how players should avoid forming obvious duos. And we saw that Memphis didn't want it to be obvious when he wanted Christmas to stay at, at the time she was previously nominated because he didn't realize that everyone already knew how tight he was with her, mm -hmm. uh, which was, of course, one reason they ended up on the block together. Right. You know, um, now the funny thing about this rule is that Memphis acted like he played the game, you know, straightforward and with his word. Uh, he even said as much in his final speech. And in, in that way, it was very much like the Memphis who played 12 years ago. When I interviewed him back then, he told me, I tried to get play the game as straightforward and honest as I could, and I hope they would respect that. But in that season, he had probably more alliances than anyone else, basically with just about everybody in the house at one point or another. So in both cases, we saw that Memphis's idea of playing straightforward and being true to his word was not the same as what most other players would think. Mm -hmm. Do you want to jump in, Anessa? Uh, no, I mean, I think that while he you know, has, I got to give him a credit where credit's due. When Tyler dropped Christmas, um, you know, inexplicably for whatever, you know, yeah, he's a 25 year old kid, whatever. Yeah. So he dropped <laughs> Christmas and, you know, Memphis swooped right up in there and picked her up. And, you know, that was impressive. The manner in which he picked her up so tightly and it was, you know, later in the game, it wasn't day one. Mm -hmm. So, so that was impressive, but I don't actually think that he thought of her as a final two. So he didn't think that it was obvious duo because he never, he even said in his exit interview, he would have taken Cody and Enzo, which is a whole other issue yeah. to the mm -hmm. final three. <laughs> yeah. But he, he, uh, Christmas would have taken him to the final two, but I don't think he would have taken her. So in his eyes, I don't think they were an obvious duo because he never felt that he was with her in a way. Yeah. And I think that that was a lot of what we saw with Memphis is that he thought he was presenting himself in a particular fashion when he actually was not. And so this is another example of that where, oh, this isn't an obvious duo, but everybody else sees it as an obvious duo. Mm -hmm. So in, in Memphis's mind, the way that he's playing his game is so under the radar and nobody knows what I'm doing, which is true at the beginning because he was able to utilize both sides and nobody really thought that he was in the is it the committee or the commission now i'm getting it all so the committee the commission the committee. was just the commission the commission is just cody and <laughs> right. cody and memphis there's right. too many names but so the the root is cody and enzo and the you wait know, is it the roots or the root <laughs> 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 but needless to say, he was very good at being under the radar at the beginning. But mm -hmm. I think that because he continued to play in that same fashion, that it ended up then working against him. And people started to pay a little more attention because he thought that he was being so sneaky and conniving. But by sharing so much information with so many people and having all of these side deals and having all of these discussions, like you said, Anessa, I mean, information in this game is that's everything. And if you've got information that you can share to make somebody else appear to be in a bad light, well, then you've got to use it to your benefit. And unfortunately, Memphis wasn't getting information like that because he wasn't creating the bonds necessary for people to share that type of information with him, except for Christmas. And he seemed to be missing that, that Christmas really was mm -hmm. his ride or die in her mind. Like that was it for her. That was her final two. And he, I don't think took full enough advantage of that particular relationship in order to further himself in the game with it. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Now, there was one final way Memphis had trouble with this rule, and that was in how he ran his HOHs like a dictatorship. Uh, he, he didn't want to tell anyone anything because he said everyone had loose lips. This is particularly ironic since he did tell others important information and, information, and loose lips from those conversations did help sink his ship, as we've already discussed in this rule. But I don't think loose lips would have been an issue with his HOHs. Uh, indeed, it would have made things simpler because then people would have known what he wanted. His own allies would have known what he wanted. Mm 
Right. And, and by acting the way he did, he he did keep his scheming secret, so we'll give him that, but at the expense of being seen as scheming too much because he wouldn't even involve his own allies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think he won an HOH rather early on in the game. I think mm-hmm. it was a second HOH. Second, yep. And in this game, as you know, I, it moves very quickly. And I think those early HOHs are critical to solidifying a strong group of people moving forward, which you know he did with the committee. But what he didn't do was then use his power that he got early in the game to really build those relationships. And when it was his HOH, he should have you know opened the door, invited people in, you know, literally, but also like into his mind, like into mm-hmm. his strategy mm-hmm. and like really fostered those, you know, relationships so that, you know, they can use that information together. Say, oh, what do you want? Like, what do you want to do? You know, build like a real relationship, uh, you know, because he has power in the game, people will come to him and he should be like inviting of that. Right. Um, but he didn't do that. And he was very like rigid, you know, like, like you said, uh, I think Jessica said this Memphis will do whatever Memphis yeah. wants to do. And it is what it is. And it doesn't really like foster like a two way street for trust, which he desperately needed later on. And he couldn't get that, you know, reciprocity because, you know, he had not done it earlier. Right. Yeah, he he definitely failed in listening to those individuals he was supposed to be closely aligned with. Those are the people that you want to solidify a bond with very early on, as you said. And by not allowing those conversations to take place, you it you really do look like you're power hungry and you're letting it get to your head. Like I'm the HOH, I'm in charge, I get to make the determination and I'm deciding who's going to be up on the block. But that even though might be good for Memphis, it's not good for Memphis long term because people are going to look at you and say, well, then why are we in an alliance with this guy? Because he is going to do what he wants. He's not going to listen to what I say. And and that narrative, again, is only going to appear to be even more Memphis centered, where Memphis is going to do what is best for Memphis, not best for the committee. And unfortunately, I think that's why he ended up where he was. Nobody could really trust him. Because there wasn't any back and forth, like, what do you think? What do I think? What's best? And then coming up with a term determination together. It was more just Memphis's way. And that was it. So I do think those that early HOH really put him in a bad position with this group of six. Yeah. All right. Um, so th- you, you mentioned, you know, uh, how Memphis is going to do what Memphis wants to do. And that takes <laughs> us to the third rule, which talks about the need to be flexible. Um In my original Why Memphis Lost column from 12 years ago, I noted that he followed this rule and didn't tie himself to one alliance and forsake all others. Um, While Julie Chen told Memphis that he was fluid and had a lot of deals going uh, after he was evicted, she was wrong as usual. Uh, In fact, he wasn't flexible at all. And he always wanted things done his way and only his way. Uh, As we we just discussed, um, he... When Memphis made his pitch to Nicole in an attempt to save himself this week, she would later say that his offer was terrible because they all know nobody can control him and he's going to do whatever he wants to do. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I And I do. I, I had an interesting thought about this rule in relationship to David because he was so adamant about voting out David. And I think he discussed some of this in his exit interviews and his concern with David was, well, he's an unknown. I don't know how he's going to play this game. And that makes me nervous. So I don't want him in the house because I don't know what to expect. But I think that he should have looked at that differently and should have been a little more flexible here because if you have somebody who's unknown and if you have this sense of yourself, like I know how to play this game better than anybody, why not take that person under your wing? Why not show David how to play this game or play the game with the person who seems to be a little more green because then you could really utilize that person to your benefit instead of just completely shutting him out and pushing him to the side when everybody is like, why are we targeting David? Like what is like, what threat does David bring to this game? Whereas Memphis was so locked into this idea that, well, I don't know David, so David needs to go. I think he should have been a little more flexible in his approach to David and the ability that he could have utilized him so differently. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so the thing is with Memphis is that he had like just a fundamental misunderstanding of people's motivations. <laughs> and he just really, he didn't think that he needed to be flexible because he thought that his plan was working 100%. He was completely blindsided. So from his perspective, like, I've played, you know, some live games like these, like, you know, fan created games where like I have a very similar way of playing. Like I make an alliance and I drive it to the end and I don't deviate from it. And, you know, because they're like shorter games. At and least that's I what think, you're telling people now in case they play with you later. Uh, you, know. <laughs> you know, and then and then I'm just blindsided and I'm sitting there like this was in nobody's best interest to vote me out. I can't believe this just happened, you know, but like because he doesn't like foresee he doesn't understand like why it wasn't in somebody's interest to do that the same way like I didn't but like the, but the but the point is is that he he didn't he didn't need to he didn't think he needed to be flexible right so he thought what he was doing was perfect and it was you know all of our interests were aligned like Vanessa was very like uh, Vanessa you know from previous whatever seasons back she always thought about like what is in somebody else's best interest to do I think he thought that too he just was totally wrong mm -hmm. and he thought you know like this isn't somebody's best interest so therefore this is going to be the move this is the answer so I don't need to be flexible I don't need David around David doesn't fit in my plans and there's you know no flexibility here because I don't need it right um and he just didn't he just didn't like have a good measure on this but you know, I don't think I don't think like being more flexible would have fit with his style of play. <laughs> oh, I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, that's where I think the, you know, the, the dictator term really comes back into play, you know, where you just assume that your way is what's going to be best for everyone, which is exactly what Memphis was doing. it. And by doing that, he was only pushing himself further and further away from the group of people that he really needed to be ingratiating himself to. Instead, they were like, nah, we're going to we'll utilize Memphis for as long as we need to. And then cut ties with him, which is unfortunately what we saw happen. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that about myself before too. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the fourth rule tells players not to let their emotions control them. And uh, Jessica, you talked about David in the third rule and it was good there, but I, I also have something about him here because my first inclination was to say that this was one area where Memphis didn't have any problems. And at, at some point I wasn't even sure if Memphis had emotions. <laughs> um, but, but then I saw that Julie Chen told Dalton Ross, he played with no emotion, no waffling and in full control of his game. And as I mentioned in the third rule, Julie's almost always wrong. So I had to immediately reconsider <laughs> my thoughts on that. And that's oh when I remembered goodness. his, his irrational need to get both Ian and David out of the house. Yeah. And mm. it, it started when he was talking about how he wanted to um, get some sort of imagined revenge for Dan against Ian. Uh, but let's face it. It was actually all about Memphis, not Dan. And it seemed to me like when you root for a baseball team to world to win the world series after that team beat yours in the playoffs, you want to have lost to the best. You don't mm -hmm. want to lose to someone who then goes on to lose in the next round. You want to lose to the eventual world champion. So you could say, aha, you know, maybe I was second best at least. Right. Um, and Memphis seemed to have an emotional need for that to be the case with himself and Dan as well. Yeah. And I do agree that there were some definite personality issues that, that he fought against here because he, again, didn't look at people in the correct fashion and in, in how it would affect his game and affect other people's games. It was this really weird kind of one sided like way of thinking that again, I think Anessa, when you, when you talk, like he didn't think that he needed to change anything up because he thought he was doing so great. I think really put blinders on him and his inability to see the other side. So, you know, David, there was an opportunity to look at David in a different light and he didn't. There was an opportunity to look at Ian in, in a different light and he didn't. He got so locked into this one-sidedness, which was based upon, I do think some place, some emotional place, especially with Ian, because it was based upon, you know, previous game. So yeah, I, I, I think that he certainly struggled in regards to those two people in particular. And I also do think that some of his, conversations I think were presented in um, kind of a demeaning fashion. And so I don't know if that comes from a place of emotion either, or if that's just the way he presents himself, but I don't think he was aware enough of other people's emotions while he was playing the game, you know, where he would present this idea and try to, 
wheel and deal and tell them what they should do and, and give them an offer of, of how we're going to make it to the end. And he never did it in a way that considered how they would respond or how they would feel about it. It was more, again, very Memphis centered. So I think that maybe that was another issue he had with this particular rule. Yeah. I mean, I think there are two issues with this particular rule about the emotions um, and they're not really that related. So from the one, the one perspective is that we have the Christmas issue. So he, Chris, Christmas really annoyed him. Okay. But Christmas was obviously completely loyal to him. And I think it's an emotional response to not want to work, lock it in with Christmas and take her to the end. There was, he should have seen that. And there was no good reason for him to say, oh, you know what? She's just really annoying. Like, I, I'm, I'd rather go with these two guys that I'm friends with, that I have a better relationship with. I think that's an emotional response. Oh, yeah. It could arguably be said that he had like a named alliance with them. He, you know, he was closer to them. That's why he went that way. But I think, no, he needed to be more flexible there. He needed to see that she was his golden ticket to the end. He would have beat her hands down. Um, and, she, you know, they could have made a run at it together. He should have went with Christmas to the end and him not even considering that, uh, I think, is an emotional response. That's one. <laughs> uh, the the second thing is that, you know, he treats people like chess pieces. And, you know, I think that that is like right now we have Cody in the game and we have two people who are literally willing to lay their life on the line for him, hand him the money just because he's got this emotional connection to them. Mm -hmm. Nobody can accuse Memphis of having an emotional connection <laughs> like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he, he puts people around where he sees them to be fit. And then it makes it really easy for those people to then turn around and also treat him like game pieces and say, look, we'll use you until we need you. And guess what? We no longer need you. Easy. Let's take you out. No hard feelings. Right. And they don't even yeah. expect him to be bitter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing. I, I, I bet if we asked Memphis, he would say that he succeeded tremendously at this rule. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, other than Ian and David, which were two big holes, he did keep his emotions out of his decision-making. Um, you know, when I interviewed him after his first season, he said that his strategy coming in was to pretty much look at everything from a business mentality, and you can't put emotion and business together. He also talked about how he could become friends with people but still vote them out in much the same way you can be friendly with an employee but still fire them if they screw up too much. All of that was good, and, and I think he carried it through to this season, but a lot of what we've talked about undercut what he was trying to do there. He, he did have that, but it, it was also just disconnected in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, And I think a lot of those ways can be either fall into the fourth rule like we were just discussing, or the fifth rule, which talks about you know pretending to be nice and playing the social game. And in my original Why Memphis Lost column, I said nobody could really complain about Memphis's behavior and that he and Dan were two of the nicest players that season. This was something he definitely did not carry over in his return. Um, in Nicole A's word association with Mike Bloom way back when, she called Memphis a pompous douchebag. Um, Enzo similarly referred to Memphis as being so effing pompous in a more recent episode. Even Julie Chen got something right when she talked to Dalton Ross about Memphis's first HOH reign, saying it's one thing to do what's best for your game, but to say that's what you're doing and be so blatant and almost unsympathetic about it to everyone, including his own alliance members, was not smart. Mm -hmm. And she added that she was sure that David felt like the nomination was a personal attack, saying the excuse was weird. You have to prove you belong here. This is not a casting call. The producers in the network decided he belonged there, so he belongs there. End of story. It was not nice. Right. Now, you know, how blatant did Memphis's bad behavior have to be for Julie to properly identify it? Um, yeah. and, and more important than Julie saying that, most of his fellow house guests were pissed at Memphis for the way he handled that situation, and he never really got any better. Yeah, and I I think this goes back to what we were talking about before is there there doesn't even seem to be a realization that he's doing it. Mm -hmm. He's just he really believed wholeheartedly that he had this game on lock and that he had his group of six and he had his two wise guys alliances and he was golden. And I think that the power kind of went to his head because once it did, he didn't feel the necessary, 
you know, need to further a relationship with someone because he was looking at everything so chess piece and 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 this is a game and and I I don't I'm not going to I'm not going to form a, a personal bond with this person because I might need to fire them later. You know that that <laughs> that analogy is is really resonating into what we see happening on screen where he's going to utilize someone as long as it's going to be beneficial for him and that's it. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that gameplay then came out in the way that he presented himself to people, the conversations he had, the things that we actually saw him do during the game because he was becoming so sure of himself that he didn't feel the need to sit back and and almost apologize and really take in how other people were feeling or take in how other people were were seeing something that was transpiring because he really did think this is my game and I'm and I I got it. So I can I can act any way I want because everyone is everyone's with Memphis. Yeah, I mean I think that he was the villain of the season. Uh, I, th I think that if you're going to point to somebody and, and I think he owns it in a way, although I think there was some talk about who's the villain and Christmas thought she was a villain. I, I think it was Memphis. I, I think and she was like the sidekick to the villain. You know, yeah. she, she's almost not even like so much else that we'll eventually discuss about Christmas. She's not even villainous enough to be a villain, you know, right. I mean, but yeah, in a way, you know, I think that uh, Memphis kind of owned this and without being results oriented on, you know, what kind of a bitter jury we have here, I think that his personality would have actually worked with the jury. I think that him, you know, being very direct with people on their way out, not giving them any false hope, you know, not pretending to be nice actually mm -hmm. would have worked for him this time. But I think that where it didn't work was forming the relationships mm -hmm. and, you know, if he had gotten there to the end, I think the jury could have respected it and been like, look, he didn't mess around with us. He didn't, he didn't BS us. He didn't pretend to be nice. He got there with his own personality this way. And that, that you got to respect that in some fashion, but he didn't get there. And yeah. he, it's because he didn't have that social capital because he didn't build it because he was so standoffish. He was a jerk and he was a yeah. pompous douchebag. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. As, um, as, as, and uh, what's her name? Nicole, I would say. Right. <laughs> yeah. That was Nicole. A that's that. Yeah. That was Nicole. Yeah, of course. I we would never right. say that. Yeah. No. Now, and of course, <laughs> I never described him on Twitter as having a hole ish, arrogant. <laughs> um, I would never do that. Um, I, I, I don't think in the end that lack of a social game specifically contributed to the decision, this decision right now mm -hmm. to get rid of him. Um, and if, if anything, in some ways, it was one thing that made him less of a threat to take to the end. Although, Anessa, you might have been right, depending on who he was up against. Right. Um, you know, it might have been okay with the jury. Um, but I do think that brings us to the sixth rule, which warns against being too much of a threat. And once again, we have a big difference between his seasons because I noted in my original Why Memphis Lost column that he did well in this regard um, at the time, never having won a single HOH and indeed having thrown those competitions twice. He even explained to the jury at the time that winning HOH might not have been the best idea for him at times because it put so much focus on that person in Memphis didn't want that in his first season. Instead, he made himself into the least threatening person by being who others needed him to be so he could progress through those means. But that's certainly not what he did this time. He said he came in wanting to win competitions. He was the HOH multiple times. As, and as we've already discussed, he certainly drew that focus onto himself, um, not only at, at the time that he was HOH, but also from his supposed allies as they looked ahead. Yeah. And perhaps this is why we're seeing the Memphis that we are seeing now is because it's such a different Memphis than what we saw in his previous season. And we've discussed this a lot with when people are repeat players, what about their games do they need to tweak? What do they need to change? And certain things they should change, other things they shouldn't. And maybe Memphis looked at his game and thought, okay, well, I was, I ended up second for a reason and maybe i ended up second because i wasn't in control because i wasn't the one who was hoh and making the decisions and really putting people on the block and showing people i was in charge i was more of a follower and so perhaps this season he came in and said you know what 
I'm not doing that. I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to take control. I'm going to tell people what I think is best. And that's the way it's going to be. And I do think that that's exactly what we ended up seeing. So I perhaps that's why we got this Memphis is because he was trying to correct what he had done in his previous season, but he overcorrected and he, he was too extreme in the move. I think if he had found a balance, he could have been in a great position by doing what he did in his previous season, by acting like you need those people, but then also also having an HOH and winning competitions, that would have been an incredible Memphis to see. But I do think he just went way too extreme. I completely agree. He could have used his comp wins, his HOH wins, in order to promote the well-being of his alliance as a whole instead of yes. his own. Or, you know, honestly, everybody's promoting their own personal yeah. interests in this game. But don't be so obvious about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, he right. could have, like, at least tried to, you know, use it as, like, a group win. And, you know, that's what Cody's doing. And, you know, look, what he did the, for this rule, don't be a threat, okay? Memphis was a threat to the most dangerous and influential person in this game. It's Cody. Right. Mm -hmm. And when he showed Cody that he was prioritizing Enzo over him, when he uh, discussed potentially backdooring Cody to Nicole, you know, that all made Cody afraid of him or, you know, the, it's the only legitimate risk to his game. And it's true that Christmas was saying this out loud, you know, for weeks now, weeks, maybe an exaggeration, but she was saying it out loud for s several times. It was obvious that Christmas was not aligned with him, but Memphis is way more of a comp threat than Christmas yep. is. Yep. She cracks under pressure and Memphis was way more able to execute on his plans than Christmas was. And it's interesting because Christmas was more of a threat to Enzo's game, but Memphis is more of a threat to Cody's game. And Cody has such a stranglehold on this game that it's just whatever he says goes. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious what you guys think would have happened if uh, Memphis never expressed his, you know, backdoor possibility to or his whatever his backdoor potential plan to Nicole. And then we have Enzo pushing to get Christmas out and we don't have Cody, you know, having this type of feeling towards Memphis. Would he have sided with Enzo there? I think that the the double um wise guys yeah. was so ingrained i mean he had he had heard about that a couple of weeks ago at least mm -hmm. and that was That's deep true. in there he was just waiting to get rid of memphis he knew at that point i cannot trust him and so the the backdoor thing certainly helped um but also i mean i do think that nicole you know cody probably could have pushed nicole either way mm -hmm. but i i think that you know, Cody wanted Memphis out. Enzo wanted Christmas out. Even if they had voted their own individual ways, Cody would, or, I'm sorry, Nicole would have broken the tie. Right. And I think Nicole also wanted Memphis out because she had at least a little something going with Christmas. Yeah. Well, can I ask you about this? Because uh, in the beginning of the week, Cody said to Nicole, you know, getting Memphis out does nothing for my game. Like, I'm only doing this because, like, you're my like you're my final two, you're mm -hmm. my alliance member, and, like, he's, you know, doing what Memphis should have done, you know, re really making her feel valued. Uh, so, I mean, maybe he was BSing there. Maybe it was yeah. in his interest to get rid of Memphis at that time, mm -hmm. but he made it sound like, I'd rather get rid of Christmas. I'm just doing this for you. Do yeah, you I, I think, too, part of Cody's, strategy there and in the decision finally to take out memphis to take what you said a step further anessa about memphis being a threat to cody i think he was even more of a threat to cody because of enzo because mm. he knew that memphis had this relationship with enzo and that there was this potential that that was going to be the final two that memphis was going to take enzo knowing that enzo is in both of those final three alliances with memphis probably spent you know i think cody probably whirled that around in his brain quite a bit because if you get down to it to the very end and you have memphis and enzo and you know that those two are tight then that puts cody on the outs so by taking mm -hmm. out memphis he also is kind of cutting out enzo's legs too because christmas doesn't have that relationship with enzo and so i think that that was probably part of that determination as to where am i better even though christmas is saying she wants me out Memphis is saying he wants me out and he also has Enzo. And this is a game of numbers for sure because we're way down there now. So two votes is less than hugely six. significant. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, less than six. Yeah, yeah. So, you Which know, you can I, count to. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he can't. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to count to six. But so I do think that that was an added part of the threat level that Memphis brought was his relationship with Enzo.
That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. that's a great yeah. point. Yeah. All right. Well, we could go to the seventh rule, which uh, says to trust almost nobody. Um, and Nessa, how do you think Memphis did in this rule? <laughs> he made the same mistake that Tyler made. He trusted Enzo, you know, and <laughs> he, he presumes that people do not use the only thing they have in this game, which is information. They, he presumed that people wouldn't use that as currency, which is a really silly presumption. And that is, you know, a huge mistake and a huge oversight on his part. He obviously trusted the wrong person. He should have put his trust into Christmas, like Jessica said. Uh, he should have never, it was too late for him to get, you know, to, to get in so tight with Enzo, thinking that Enzo is going to be true to him where Enzo was 100% with Cody at this time. And he should have suspected that based on how the voting had happened before then. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Yeah, me too. I I, I think that, uh, you know, it, it goes back to something I said earlier. He recognized that there were loose lips in the house, but he failed to recognize the loosest lips that applied directly to the people he was talking to. Mm -hmm. So it was like he had the right idea. And applied it in completely the wrong way. Yes. Do you think he could have operated differently or made different decisions if he went into the weeks knowing or presuming that Enzo would have disclosed this to Cody? You know, operating under like different parameters with the assumption that, okay, maybe, maybe he affirmatively goes to Cody and says, listen to what I did, you know, just so you know, mm -hmm. like maybe close the loop on that. Would <gasps> That's that have a changed? good point. I like that. If he had started with it, if he had told Cody right from the beginning, when he sat down to tell him about the wise guys and he had said, okay, here's the deal. We're doing this final three. This is the real final three, but I all, we, we also need to control Christmas. Yes. So mm -hmm. we're going to do something like, like we did with the slick six. Um, although I don't even remember if he was in the slick six anymore. I don't I don't think he was. The slick six. Yeah. So, so, uh, but something, you know, along those lines and we're going to do this other one without you, we're going to tell her that we don't have you in this final three. So she's going to think this is great, but it's really our way to control her. I think that you would know. have been super smart. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think we see that in survivor a lot where mm -hmm. someone will get together and we'll say, okay, my real alliance is with you guys, right. but I'm going to go over to them. And that's, you know, I'm not, you know, that's my fake alliance. I mean, Tony did that the whole winners at war. Oh yeah. yeah. The whole time. Everybody thought Tony was with them mm -hmm. and he would tell everybody else, no, you're my real alliance. This is my fake alliance, but obviously right. only one was real. And I mean, to some extent, Cody has been doing that this season too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if he had looped in Cody, I think it could have gone a whole different way because it was the fact that he didn't loop in Cody and Cody right. found another way that was the biggest problem. And it would have been interesting to then see his response to Enzo sharing that information. So if Enzo is out of the loop too and doesn't know that this is what's happening. So he brings Cody in and says, Cody, this is what's, what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden Enzo comes to him and says, hey, just so you know, this is what Memphis did. I think then you also win points, more points with Memphis, because now you can go to Memphis and be like, I can't trust Enzo. He just threw you under the bus. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it could have definitely worked to his benefit if he had played it off that way, which he didn't. But I think that that would that's a genius move right there. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can move to Appendix A, which deals with the jury phase of the game and planning for the end. There are two things to talk about here, what, what Memphis did to plan ahead and what the others accomplished in voting out Memphis. For the first part, Memphis was not so good at jury management. Um, I mean, I, I do think, Anessa, you're right, that by being straightforward with them, um, that, that did earn him potential points. But he also did things like targeting David for no good reason. Uh, the way he behaved in general, I just don't feel like in most situations it made the jurors want to vote for him at the end if he had made it again. Um, now, if he makes it against Christmas, OK, but if he makes it against someone likable, mm, it, it would yeah. have been difficult. I think if you have to spend time apologizing for your behavior to certain people who are on the jury, then you're in a really, really bad spot. And I think that we would have seen a lot of that with Memphis where he would have had to have led with, I'm sorry, I did this. This is why I did it. 
as opposed to your game kind of speaking for itself and you get to talk about your moves, you end up having to spend more time talking about relationships that you didn't create or how you treated someone. Because I think that we do see juries make emotional decisions where if there's two people that they're having to vote against and they think they both played the same kind of game, well, then you're likely to vote for the person that you liked better, you know, like, okay, if I have to pick a winner, I want to pick someone that I actually liked more because they both played the same kind of game. And I, so I do think Memphis definitely would have struggled depending upon who he was sitting next to, but having to apologize, which I don't think he would have done. I think he would have owned what he did, owned his gameplay, which then probably would have left even more of a sour taste in people's mouths. I don't know. I, I, Slightly disagree. Okay. I yeah. I think no. that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would have earned respect. I, first off, he would have lost to Cody. Everybody would have lost to Cody, hands down. Not even like worth a discussion. Would, he would gets have, demolished by Cody. Will. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. He he gets demolished by Cody. But I think he actually beats everybody else. Um, mm-hmm. I think that he beats because he's going to go into the jury. He's not going to be apologetic. He's going to say, I played a powerful game. I made the right decisions. I got myself here. I put everybody in place to get me here. And I played a selfish game. And that's how you win this game. And I did everything I was supposed to to get myself here, which is the objective of the game. And I'm sorry you feel a particular way about that, but this is the best way to play. And if people are inclined to vote emotionally, then they're going to do it anyway. But if he's sitting up against Nicole, they hate her anyway. (laughs) (laughs) If he's sitting against Christmas, that's an easy win. The only person he may have a bit of a trouble with is Enzo. But I think he still beats Enzo because he made every single move to get there. And then he would have been the one taking Enzo. If Enzo takes him, then it still undermines Enzo's position with the jury because it's like, why did you bring him to the end? You could have brought Christmas or Nicole. Like you shouldn't have brought the architect of the dominant alliance in the game to the end. You shouldn't have done that. That was a big mistake. Right. So I think anybody he sits up against at the end, he would have won. And he didn't let them feel bitter on the way out because he told them directly what he was going to do. And because mm-hmm. he treated like he was like Spencer Bledsoe, he treated people like game pieces and Spencer would have won Kagayan had he been there. And you know, I, although he didn't win the next nice spoiler alert, he didn't win the, yeah. but like, <laughs> I, 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 I do think that, you know, there is some advantage to being direct with people and telling them what you're going to do and not giving them false hope and not letting them be, have an emotional response to your way of playing. Cause right. then it doesn't give them the license to have an emotional response when they're voting. Cause it's like, well, that wasn't my game. So are you going to vote with emotions or vote based on strategy? Like this is all stars. I don't know. No, I, I would think, have probably lost though. No, but I, I think that is a really valid point because I do think that I appreciate when people own what they did 100%. Like, I think that that's, that's the smarter thing for you to do because then you're not making excuses. If you can say I did this and if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but this is how I played the game and this is what got me here. But I think his problem is that part of his getting there was the way he treated people in getting there. And so I think that that's where he might've run into an issue where it wasn't just playing the game where he made smart moves and he, and he managed to get people together and he managed to, to form alliances and and whatnot. He also just spoke to people in, in a fashion that I, I think some people might struggle with. I think David would definitely struggle. And I think unfortunately with the people that we've seen on this jury, I think a lot of them are angry And I think that the way that they're going to respond is being angry to whoever is in the final two. And so that's why I think he might have struggled. Do I think he had a great chance of beating most people that sat there with him? Probably. But he would have really had to present it in a way, like you said. I mean, you've got to own it to try to make them take the emotional component out of it. But I just don't know with this group if they can do that. I I really don't. I think that they came into this game with a lot of emotions, already having opinions of people like you talked about, Nicole. And I think that's going to be a big hurdle for a lot of them to get over. Yeah, he would have lost yeah. to Tyler. I think. Oh, I'm sorry. He would have. He oh, would have lost to Ty- somebody like Tyler. Would yeah. have crushed him. I think because yeah. Tyler, yeah. people like him. Yeah. I, I just think. I mean, Anessa, a lot of what you're saying is true, but there's a couple of things. One, in the Big Brother finale, you barely have any time to explain your game. Oh, this that's is not true. Survivor jury, where you have hours yeah. to try to convince people. Um, and two, when you have multiple people calling him some variant of pompous douchebag. 
You know, not many people want to vote for a pompous douchebag to win. Um, and I, I just think, you know, that they saw him uh, they saw him when he was in in charge as a dictator, and I would I would spell that D I C K tater, um, <laughs> and you know he just it was a lot to come over. And you know R Rob Rob Sesternino frequently says that people vote for the person they like the most in the end. Now I don't mm -hmm. agree with Rob on that. You know I'm not going to put him in the Julie Chen category by any means, but I don't agree with Rob on that 100. Uh, percent You know I do think. It's it's and I think he's even, you know, been more detailed about that. You know, if they have if everybody has done the basics in the game, then they vote for the one they like the best. Um, and, and, but I do. I think that there's a lot to that. I mean, it it is still voting for, you know, someone to win. And if you've got someone who says I moved all the chess pieces and another person who at least can make the claim whether it was Nicole or Enzo, I mean, neither of them did a lot, but both of them say, well, I sat back and let others do the work for me. We've seen people like that win recently. Ugh, mm -hmm. Puke. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, against Memphis, it would have been, you know, a possibility just because, uh, can I really vote for the pompous douchebag? Um, so, so I don't know. Uh, we'll never know because he didn't make it. Right. Um, you know, it, now moving to the second part of this appendix, which is, you know, what the other players did. I think they did a fair job of managing Memphis. He left saying he had no ill will, even though both Cody and Enzo turned on him. Um, I, I suppose it could be an issue if Christmas ends up in the final two. But even then, I think he may follow through on his statement about this. This is being a game. This is a game and rewarding the best player. Yeah. Um, and quite frankly, after everything we discussed, he would be a massive hypocrite if he didn't. Oh, yeah. Yes, you know? absolutely. Now, yeah. Mind you, we have all seen massive hypocrites in this game. Um, you know, I, I know in this game in Survivor, you know, people who say I, I'm I'm not voting for this person to win because they voted for me. Well, you voted for them in the same damn vote. What the hell are you talking about? Right. You know? Yeah. Um, but I, I just I don't think he will be that big a hypocrite i think he will vote for the person who played the best game i also think he won't have much of a choice because it'll be cody versus someone but yeah no i think that makes sense because i do think that that would be very much in line with what we've seen all season with memphis is to take the emotion out of it and look at who played the best game because in his mind he thinks he played the best game Mm -hmm. So he's then going to need to reward whoever played that game with him. And if it's Cody, well, then he can say, congratulations, Cody. I got you there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he could feel like he had something to do with it. Oh, yeah. I, I see a lot of myself in Memphis. This is really problematic. <laughs> 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 I'm amazing. having like a therapy moment here. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely think he's going to vote for he's going to vote for Cody if Cody's there and we all know Cody's going to be there. So yeah. he's going to, I think that's a log vote. Um, I think he's, you know, he's never going to vote for, I mean, I don't think he would ever vote for Christmas. He didn't even want to bring her to the end. You know, I don't think he's ever going to vote for Nicole while he says like, she's a lovely person. I don't think he respects her game. And I don't think he's going to vote for Enzo because he sees Cody as a dominant player. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think he's going to vote straight on gameplay, regardless of, how he was evicted. And I do think it's kind of like he could take pride in, oh, well, they got me out because I'm like such a big compy. So, you know, right. I had something to do with yeah. Cody winning. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. I put my mark on the season. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it's about time to wrap things up. So, uh, Inessa, why don't you uh, give us your final thoughts? About Memphis, you know, I think that, as I said, he came into this game thinking he was playing season 10. But like Cody said, you know, the game is now decades ahead of him. It used to be that people wouldn't even want to win the first HOH because they thought it would put too much of a target on their back. But now it's a dominant strategy to win the first competition, whether it be a head of household or the camp counselor or whatever. You know, ask Jackson, uh, Cody, likely uh, Tyler. We have, uh, you know. Nicole Franzel, even from her season, always wins Always wins the first competition. The game moves much faster now than it ever moved before. And having him come in thinking that he could just build this alliance, sit back, 
go to sleep and be fine until the end. And then, and then when you get to the end, when you get to the final six, then wake up, scramble and try to like do next phase of the game. That was a huge under, under like, um, it was, it was a huge, um, you know, inability to really understand what other people are doing in this game. The game doesn't stop because you go to sleep at nine o'clock. All these other people were fortifying relationships, building their close alliances, building their final twos. And then when he finally got to the to the game, when he finally figured out that it was time to do something, it was way too late. I think his biggest downfall is that he did not scheme and plot enough. There's a lot of shortcomings in the other rules of the game, like he trusted the wrong person, he wasn't flexible, um, but all of that just stems back from the fact that he did not scheme and plot enough. Had he schemed and plot enough, he would have had these alliances, he would have had this long, game-long relationships with people, he would have had the social capital in order to make all these other fun things work out. Like Cody now has these two final twos and it's all going his way because he put the work in way early on. I think that Memphis lost because he did not scheme and plot enough. That's that. <laughs> I like it. So oh, my turn now, look, because I get to That's I get right. to be the center stage here. So I do think that Memphis came into this game really with the ability to take it all the way. And we saw him in his previous season do very well. And I just think that he he couldn't find the proper balance this season. He went to the extreme and how he could actually win the game because he thought he needed to be in control and he took his control to the next level. It wasn't a control where I'm working with a group of people and we're controlling the game together. He wanted to work with a group of people and control that group of people. And unfortunately the group that he was working with didn't want to be controlled in that fashion. And they did take time trying to come up with other mechanisms in which to get to a final two or to a final three. And although Memphis was doing the same thing, he was coming up with two different final three versions and he had a potential final two. He was coming up with options, but he wasn't coming up with relationships that were going to support those options. People were going to do what was in, in their own best interest. And they were going to play with people that they thought they could trust, not someone that they thought was going to tell them what to do. And I think we saw a lot of Memphis telling people what to do, trying to tell people how to play the game based upon what was in his own best interest and not theirs. He wasn't very good at finding that balance of recognizing what someone else needs and also recognizing his own needs and kind of melding them together. It was very Memphis centered. And unfortunately, I think Memphis could have done so much better in this game had he formed those relationships like we saw with Cody. Cody is doing exactly what Memphis is doing in this game, right? They're they're scheming and plotting very similarly. They're creating alliances. They're they're part of the same alliances. But Cody is taking that next step as Anessa said. He's forming those personal relationships. He's creating trust with those people. Memphis is not someone that people in the house feel they can trust. And because of that, Memphis was the one that was being left out and not being brought along like Cody has been. And so I do think that unfortunately for Memphis, the control might have gotten to his head and this idea that that was the most important thing. I need to be in control in order to win as opposed to I need to be in control and I need to form these personal relationships with people at the same time in order to find myself in a winning position at the end. So unfortunately, Memphis, he's no longer with us and the wise guys is a, is a done deal, but it'll be interesting to see how this all wraps up. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout the season, Memphis thought in many ways that he was running the show, even though he wasn't, as you mentioned, Vanessa, he believed he formed the committee and he had the double wise guys Alliance. He even went so far as to tell us this week, this is how you play the game. Take notes, everyone. <laughs> As I said on Twitter, I'm taking notes, Memphis, for this week's podcast, where you will be the star. And here we are. In my Why Memphis Lost column for his first season, I noted that Memphis made some key mistakes. By making alliances with just about everybody, the jurors eventually talked and compared notes, and they didn't like what they heard. He didn't make it to the end this time, in large part because people like Cody, Enzo, and Nicole talked while still in the game, and they didn't like what they heard. After he was evicted, Memphis said he doesn't regret making two versions of the wise guys, but he should, because finding out about that may not have completely been his undoing, but it certainly sparked the notion in Cody's head that Memphis couldn't be trusted, while Cody did trust Nicole and Enzo, who brought him the information. This was compounded by the fact that Memphis had gone from being a competition zero in his first season to a comp beast this time. That made him more of a 
who fancies herself a comp beast, but is closer to a zero in that regard. <laughs> if you have someone who you can't trust to take you to the end and who has a good chance of being in a position to make those decisions, you have to get rid of them when you can. The decision to vote out Memphis might not have been great for Enzo, but as we've seen all season, the final decisions belong to Cody, who also has Nicole in his pocket, at least for now. So Enzo really didn't have a say in the matter. Memphis was a threat to Cody, who Cody no longer trusted because he'd schemed and plotted too much after not doing it enough earlier. No matter what else happened to help or hurt Memphis's game, it in the end, it came down to that. And Anessa, you mentioned it. He he was a danger to the main person in control. And that is why Memphis lost. There we are. Well, this was fun. Yeah. Listen, they all screwed up this week because <laughs> they should have just backdoored Cody and then. We well, yes. Had anytime. Different... I mean, that, that's something I've been saying. And I will say probably two weeks from now is all of you people who had a chance to get rid of Cody and didn't. <laughs> you only have yourselves to blame. Yeah, I mean, Nicole yeah. was like, it'll be a 9-0 vote. Like, she was actually saying this out loud. It will be a 9-0 vote. And yeah. still, no, mm -mm, no to switch up there. It's crazy. Yeah. You know you know how they all talk about their dreams in the house? I literally had a dream last night because I was thinking about this. And I'm thinking, what if Tyler literally puts, I, and I know everybody's said this before, but in the triple eviction, Tyler just puts up Enzo and Cody. Who goes mm -hmm. out there? Who goes out? Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it was so quick. I think Enzo goes out, but it still changes Ooh. the course of things. Um, I just don't think that they had the ability to think that quickly in terms of, oh, this is our opportunity. I don't right. know, though. I don't know. <sighs> Would have been amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's something I think uh, I think I mentioned, was it last week or the week before? So I think it was last week when we were talking about Tyler going, was if you're going to take the shot at someone in your alliance, take the shot at the person at the top of the alliance. Right. You've already knew that you screwed up in in voting the way you did to try to take out Nicole, you already know you're on their bad side. So take one of them out. Yeah. Cut the head sure. of the beast. What's right. the point mm -hmm. of going for, you know, some right. minor yeah. part? Yeah. All right. Well, as we start to wrap things up here, I wanted to mention that although the rules are different for Survivor and Big Brother, uh, behind Jessica is a great depiction of the Survivor rules drawn by Eric yeah. Reichenbach. Uh, if you're interested, you can get a version of that poster, not with all the signatures and autographs on it, but <laughs> right, uh, hey, if you put in the work, you can. <laughs> right, um, exactly. uh, you can get that poster at tinyurl.com slash David Rules Poster 2. And we also have another way to get the rules, so you could always have them with you. And that is, of course, in t-shirt form. Um, so just go to robhaswebsite.com or robhasapodcast.com. Click on the merch link near the top and you can sort the store so the new items are right there. Um, also you can make sure you're subscribed to all of the RHAP big brother podcasts at Rob has website.com slash BB podcast, or on your favorite podcatcher. We are also on the reality TV wrap ups feed. So if you subscribe to that feed, you'll get this, our survivor podcasts. When those come back again, um, anything else we might do and so much more. Now, one of those other shows that you'll get on reality TV rehap ups is the Bachelorette Rehap Up podcast. Uh, that's not us, uh, but uh, Claire Crawley is trying to find love during these crazy pandemic times during an all new season of The Bachelorette. Through dates, rose ceremonies, and plenty of drama, each week Claire narrows down the field of potential suitors to find the one. So join Amy and Haley each each week as they discuss all the craziness of trying to find love while on one of the country's most talked about reality shows. Whether or not you're here for the right reasons, Amy and Haley will be there for you through Claire's entire journey. Uh, this and <laughs> all the wrap ups. <laughs> Are you watching The Bachelorette? Either of you? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> no. Sorry, I'm, Claire. I'm just, I'm, yes, I apologize too, but I just can't. I can't bring myself to do it. I've tried. Yes, yes. I've tried. I used to back when I was running my website, I used to watch them all, you know, you were but, dedicated. Uh, I was, I was. Um, but it, for those who do watch, or even if you don't want to watch and just want to listen to Amy and Haley, uh, you know, this 
podcast, that podcast, all the wrap ups are made possible with the support of RHAP patrons. You can get access to our patron podcast feed, our Facebook and Discord communities, and much more by visiting robhaswebsite.com slash patron. Once you join, you'll see all the great perks Rob has, including tons of opportunity to interact with Rob on you know shows like the weekly call in before each eviction episode, patron mafia, um, and more. So again, remember to go to robhaswebsite.com slash patron. Once you get to the Facebook groups, make sure to say hello. Yes, and Anessa can attest to all of the wonderful things that come with being a patron. So, and I'd like to ask after you After parties all, at some point. Yes, <laughs> after parties. Good good things. Trust me, it's good stuff. Uh, you can also follow us all on Twitter. I am at Jessica Lewis 89 which is here. He is at David Bloomberg. And I believe, if I point it this direction, there we go, at David Bloomberg. <laughs> and Anessa... It, that's your Twitter handle, right? Anessa yes. the Mesa. That's amazing. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so you should definitely follow all of us to get all of our inside skinny on things like Big Brother. And if Survivor ever comes back into our world, we tweet about that too. And anything else related to what's happening in our lives. And David Bloomberg loves to post selfies of himself, especially yeah. in his mask. So <laughs> be looking out for those too. So at Jessica Lewis 89, at David Bloomberg, and at Anessa the Mesa. Yeah. So besides, yeah, besides Twitter, Anessa, where, where else can people find you and anything else that you're doing other than, you know, ducking you in a, a mafia game? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not, you can email me, um, you know, you can email me at Anessa. You can find me on Facebook, but you can email me at Anessa.Hewitt, H-U-O-T, uh, Anessa, I-N-N-E-S-S-A, period, Hewitt, H-O-T, <laughs> at gmail.com. Um, you can find me on Facebook. If anybody has questions about crazy things that happen to them at work, let me know. Um, <laughs> everybody, everybody should make a plan, go out and vote. That's coming out soon. Uh, you know, the deadlines, everybody should be aware of those. You know, look into your localities and see, you know, what the situation is, just come up with a plan of what to do. Even if you live in a state where it doesn't really matter, you know, popular vote matters. I think it's important to have your voice heard and, um, you know, shout out to the pizza and beer Alliance and, uh, everybody should come play mafia. That's right. That's right. Nice. All right. Well, now we need a hashtag and I have several possibilities here. Oh, I'm sure um, you do. Yes. There's a <laughs> hashtag day 69. Um, ha hashtag dictator spelled D I C K. Uh, and of course, hashtag pompous douchebag. Although there's some slight possibility that that could be confused with other pompous douchebags who I might be in the news. I think all of them are bad. Um, you think all of them are bad. Okay. Well, I mean, because they're all, um, a little more risque. <laughs> so. No. Well, do you have a better one? I I hmm. I really don't unfortunately. Ah. Um I mean I like them, don't get me wrong, but they all could lead people down a very, you know, scary rabbit hole. <laughs> well, that's what, mm. you know, that's what Twitter is, is a scary rabbit it, hole. It it is um, a scary rabbit so. hole for sure. I do like the dictator. I I think out of all of those um because I mean, I think that that's appropriate but it doesn't need to be spelled d-i-c-k <laughs> well i think it, but uh, uh, i i think it might <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah all, all right, right i think so that's we, the winner yeah we'll go with hashtag dictator d-i-c-k-t-a-t-o-r uh and of course there's the hashtag for this podcast overall which is why x lost in a week, we'll be right back here to discuss big brother again jessica and i will and we have two great guests uh, to follow Anessa, who was a great guest, um, yes. <laughs> coming coming for the final two weeks. First, we have uh, Teresa T. Bird Cooper uh, next week. Um, and then we're going to bookend the season by bringing back our first guest, and that's Ronnie Talbot from Big Brother 11. So that will uh, close everything out as we probably discuss why Cody won. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, next know. week, next week, yeah. the big thing will be anyone who knows T-Bird knows that she has good things to say about everyone. Yes. And yes, everyone does. who knows this podcast knows we don't always say just good things uh, since we just discussed the pompous, pompous douchebag dictator. Um, so it, it will be a it, it will be a test for T-Bird. You know, I can she be. say things that aren't good? Uh, this will be this will be fun. I, I guarantee it. And it then, of course, closing it out with Ronnie also will be great. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this episode was also great because, yes. Anessa, you 
I'm just going to keep saying the word great. Uh, you were awesome. Uh, oh, sometimes thank you. You, you came up with things. It's funny because, you know, I have my notes here. It's like, oh, I'm going to talk about that next. Oh, nope. And that's just cover that. We mm -hmm. can move on. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's no, good. That's, that's great. Good. Yeah. Um, and then other times you, you had things that I hadn't even thought of. So, hey, that's the best we can ever get. Yes. This thank you, really Vanessa. Fun. This was Thank so you. much fun having you because it is nice. We can see that you genuinely love the show and you love the strategy involved. And so it's always good to be able to open up the discussion and have more people involved. Sometimes David, you know, says things that aren't completely right. So Never. it's good. Thank you. you know, it's funny. <laughs> I think I think it's because I recently started watching Big Brother and I marathoned all of it very quickly. So I don't have like Big Brother fatigue because I haven't been watching it for decades nice. or however long this thing has been on. Decades. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's so great. I, it was wonderful. It, it was great. Thank you guys for having me. Sure. This was a lot of fun. Well, thank you. And I think, Jessica, do you have other oh, thank yes, yous? Oh, yes, my gosh, I have other thank yous. See, I'm getting thrown <laughs> off here. Uh, we have to thank Scott St. Pierre for all of the editing that he does on both the video and audio version of Why Blank Lost. Scott, you do an amazing job, so thank you so much for all of the work that you do. And also thank you to Will from America, who created the theme song that you hear on the audio version of this podcast, Why Blank Lost. Thank you, Will. It's a great little catchy theme song. So if you want to listen to that and then come over here and see our faces, you can do it that way, whatever you prefer. But thank you to both of those fine <laughs> gentlemen. That's that's right. For all of the great work that they do for us. Yes. And uh, yeah, a special thank you again to Anessa for joining us today. It, it was so nice to talk to you without worrying about whether you're going to murder me. <laughs> well, what he means is he, he keeps thinking like, uh, I'm not a serial killer. Okay. He keeps <laughs> thinking that he's talking about this mafia game and we always go after each other very early. So th this is what he's referring to. I don't actually try and kill him. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sure. Sure. <laughs> No, that's the what they all killer, say. The serial killer is Nicole Franzel, remember? Yes. No, that's, that's right. So yes. Oh, God, those comics. Yeah, <laughs> those were great. Cool. I love yeah. those. Those were good. Uh, I think yeah. they could have been a little better. Yeah, they could have, I think. We're, oh. we're going to disagree with you on this one. Okay, well, listen, this is why I think it's great. Because it's it's always nice to have a caricature of yourself, right? And so yeah. I think it's, it's interesting to see what they chose for each of the individual caricatures. And... Um, and the response that some people had to the characters that were chosen mm -hmm. was, was also fun to watch. Yes, yes. That's I appreciated true. Nicole. I appreciated Nicole, like with her eye twitching, being like, oh, yeah. they always have Janelle. <laughs> yeah. <so> good. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. This is what made it so great because you got to watch everyone's reaction to what? Why is this person called this? And this person. So that to me was was very fun because you. It, you know that that took some extra time away from their final times because they were re reacting to what they were seeing as well. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. All right. Well, also thank you, Jessica, for another great week. Even if you, you dared to say a couple minutes ago that I'm not always right. I'm, um, I'm just saying, you know, it's good to have another voice in here sometimes. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, I was your ride or die, remember? And then was you threw me being into the, bus. the key. Yes. I know. So and, Anessa, I have to... Anessa, you wanna you wanna be my ride or die? <laughs> I filed away that information. I'm yeah. gonna pull that out later. I am yeah. ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All oh right. Oh my goodness. Well, Jessica and I and T Bird will see everyone uh, uh, next week. Until then, bye. Bye. Bye.